This is the Money Loves Women podcast, the podcast that guides women to wealth and an extraordinary life. Here's your host, Dr. Deborah Ekstrom. This is Dr. Deborah Ekstrom for Money Loves Women podcast. Today, I'd like to welcome Walker Dibel. I said it right, 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 Walker. Dibel. And uh, Walker is the author of Buy Then Build. How Acquisition Entrepreneurs Outsmart the Startup Game. And he's going to talk to us about that. Interestingly, he's done startups as well as uh, acquired companies. He's been in Forbes, Entrepreneur, uh, Fast Company, Harvard Business Review. He's practiced acquisition entrepreneurship since 2006. Uh, Made a lot of revenue, a lot of money that way. And he's going to talk to us about that today. Right now, Walker helps online entrepreneurs exit their companies with Quiet Light Brokerage, my favorite brokerage uh, for business brokerage. It's the first boutique M&A firm focused solely on online businesses. And that's it really seems to be where the growth is at right now, Walker. So you're going to tell us more. But that's just a, kind of the minimum uh, introduction for him. He has an MBA at the Olin School of Business in Washington University, St. Louis. And he's a emeritus professor there now, too. Um, and he's given us, uh, he's spoken at uh, Duke University, at their business school, and at MIT. I think they were fighting over you, weren't they, Walker? <laughs> uh, no comment. Deborah, thank you so much for having me. I, I, I'm a big super fan of yours, and I can't wait to, uh, to dig in. Tell us a little bit about uh, yourself, just to give us context, where you grew up, you know, what your family was like, and what influenced you early on. Yeah. That, wow. That's interesting. Question. So, so I grew up in St. Louis. Um, I left for about 10 years, um, came back to go to the Olin School of Business and uh, met a girl. And she wasn't going to school there, but, uh, you know, she was local. And now we've got like kids and a dog and property and all the rest of it. So I can't I can't get out of here, um, which is fine. <laughs> you know, we pay state taxes and stuff. So we've tr- I've tried um, my dad. Uh, my dad owned a business. Um, but only because two people died. And so he's a, always a big fan of, you know, if two people die, you end up with a company is always his advice. <laughs> and, um, you know, my grandfather, the, the book by then Bill was actually dedicated to him because he actually took over his dad's feed company. And then um, he bought a company, a, um, it was a, it was a metal fabrication company that did air filters. Okay. And so uh, my grandfather both of both of um both of my dad and then both of his brothers all owned their own companies by acquisition and then also on my mom's side my grandfather um ended up uh buying his dad's company right and so so i was surrounded by people that were actually you know um i guess small business entrepreneurs right yeah and then my mom my mom's side was all sort of like academics and um artists right yeah. i mean it's kind of it's kind of a, a vague way to describe them, but it was it was sort of like you know the the arts and 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 the practicality of economics kind of coming together like you know at the holidays. <laughs> yeah. So your first degree though was in literature and religion. You're right, <laughs> Deborah. You're going back on me. Wow. That was your mom's side, right? And then so then all the business stuff took you over. So what happened between yeah. uh, undergraduate and getting your MBA? At all. You know, yeah, what I would tell you is, okay, so number one, what I would tell you is obviously we don't major in high school, right? But but like we all have sort of like types, right? I, I was really into fine arts in high school. And you could say that like I kind of majored in fine arts. I obviously didn't want to go to art school because like I, I was I had too much of a business sense about me and I didn't want to be like starving. Uh, so even though I've got a passion for it, I just wanted a liberal arts education. And people were like, so what are you going to do with that? Like, are you going to be a teacher? And I was like, no, um, I'm going to go into business. And they're like, why aren't you majoring in business? And I'm like, what am I going to learn? Like buy low, sell high? Like, <laughs> I was like, if I, if I want a very specific degree, I plan to go back and do that at a later date, right? The interesting thing, Deborah, is that like, even at that time, this would have been the late 90s, like more CEOs had English degrees than any other degree at that time, right? And so I think that it's kind of like one of these things where, you know, you have to, dip, you have to fit in, but you also have to stand out. Right. And so when I did eventually go back to business school, not only did I have, you know, sort of like the, the English lit degree and, um, you know, the religious studies was really Eastern religion. So it was kind of like philosophy more than it was the way that we think about religion, mm-hmm. but like, um, uh, you know, so I sort of had that background, but also 
during college, um, we filmed a movie and ended up, it took like four years and we ended up selling it to Lionsgate. And, uh, you know, you know, the movie cost like $180,000 and we sold it for like 50,000, but that was like a big win. Those are like, that's like how film economics works. Right. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, uh, to, you know, and so I'm still involved in film to this day and it's just sort of, you know, framed out that, that, that side of my capacity, but, but, uh, um, uh, yeah, but it, yeah. So I went, so after school, um, the, I knew that I needed to get a job. In at, like number one, I wanted a job that at a company that like had a name that everyone would know. Like I didn't want to just like go down the street here in St. Louis and work or whatever. Like I wanted a name that was like okay. And anything, any place where I could go to to like learn and get trained was really my goal. And so luckily for me at that time, the tech boom was happening. And my first job out of school with my English and religious studies degree, I was a stockbroker uh, at, at Charles Schwab. And so um, they got me licensed through uh, through their training program. I was licensed by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, I worked for about eight months um, as a broker. And then after that, um, they moved me to inbound margin call people because the whole tech boom was busting. Right. And so I they moved me. And so I was then recipient of everyone uh, having to, you know, sell all of their stocks while they were down because they were on margin call. It was a terrible experience. But um, they did that for me right before they laid me off, (laughs) (laughs) which was great. (laughs) And what did you do right after that? You know, I mean, I mean, it's it, look. I mean, what right after that? I mean, you know, look. I, like I stood there, and they were laying everyone off, and there was grown men crying. You know, who had made their whole careers there, and they gave me a severance package. And I just, I looked right at them and said, "Is this negotiable?" And I'll never forget. She laughed and said, "No." So I signed. They gave me a check, and I went to Mexico for a week. And then I came <laughs> back. But then I came back, and I was kind of looking for a job. I was in Denver at that time. I was looking for work, and um. I really, I really couldn't find any at that time because 9-11 happened shortly after I got laid off, right? Yeah. So 9-11 occurred and the whole economy was like at a screeching halt. Um, I ended up moving to Northern California, okay? And I had some friends out there in the East Bay area. And so I, I took accounting at Berkeley while I was, I got a job in like three days out there. And so I was selling like um, in the medical area. And then um, I was going to Berkeley and then I was working in the city a little bit. And then here's the big thing is that my roommate from college ended up working as Scott Rudin's assistant down on the Paramount lot. He was not involved in the movie we made. Right. So he was on the Paramount lot and I didn't have any friends. I just moved there. And so every you know Friday I would finish my job and then drive down um, and I'd be in L.A. by two in the afternoon and I'd spend like three days in L.A. every week. Right. And so I had free access on the Paramount lot. and I started figuring out like. Hey, like, how does this work? How come, how come there's all these production companies on the lot, but no one works for Paramount? Like, what do you do? What does, what does she make? You know, what does he do? What does he make? You know, you know, just trying to figure out like the economics of the, of the movie business. Right. And then, uh, later when I went to the Olin school of business, we started, me and a friend of mine started the Olin, um, entertainment media association and called all the studios and said, Hey, we're MBA students. <laughs> Can we come to her? <laughs> right. We just made it up. Right. And so, um, so film was always one of those things for me, but, but, um, uh, I worked for a while and then I moved back to St. Louis after that to, to get my MBA. Go on. Sounds like a lot of fun. Sounds like you had a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was, yeah, it's good. But, but I guess, you know, the thing is, is that for me, it's all, it's, it's always been about, you know, I, I, I'll never forget, I had this art teacher that just drove me crazy in high school. And um, his last name was Bassman. I actually can't remember his first name at this at this moment, but I was an upperclassman and I had Bassman and he would, um, he would always say, your art needs to be practical, okay? And it just drove me crazy because it was like, no, we need art for art's sake, right? And it was like, nope, it's gotta be practical, right? Like even if you were making something in pottery, it had to have some kind of use other than just like being a thing, right? Or, um, you know, and so, so I think that for me, that ended up ringing true because it was kind of like, okay, like take, for example, you know, as soon as I got into business school, I, I ended up trying to use it as a resume shield. I was like, I want to start companies, right? Like, like my whole family was buying companies and whatever. And I was like, you know, like, that's great, but I want to, I want to start something, right? And I just come from California and all the rest of it. And, 
um, I learned a, I learned a few things, right? But but one of the things I learned was um, number one, I, I I guess I'm a terrible entrepreneur, okay? <laughs> but not really, because it's really just statistics that they don't work. We can get into that. But number number two um, is that you know when I would walk up and down like Y Down Boulevard here in St. Louis and just look at all the big houses, right? And ask myself like, okay, how did all these people? Who are these people? Like, how did they get all this wealth? And like, no one here in St. Louis is like from Silicon Valley. There's no one on the cover of magazines explaining like how to innovate the world. And I'll never forget, I was sitting with an alumnus, alumnus at uh, at at WashU, and you could just tell like he was a little gray. He was like very content very well dressed, you know, and he was just there for education. And, and I was like, what do you do? And he said, well, you know, can lights, and there's some can lights in the room. I said, yeah. And he said, there's that piece of metal that like makes the can just around the edge. And I said, yeah. And he said, we make those. And there was this pregnant pause. And I said, how many companies are there that make those? And he said, two. <laughs> And I was like, gosh, like it's all about these totally unsexy businesses that are cash flowing, right? Yes. And here's, here's, here's the point is that like when you have a startup, okay, the thing is, is that if you are not cash flow positive, that means you are not sustainable. And if you are not sustainable, you are not a business. And in other words, if you are starting a company, you can't start a company for the, for the impact's sake. You have to build something that's sustainable and that's done through the cash flow that's generated by the business. So it's like art being practical. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So he, he made a good point and it stuck with you. That's, it that's good stuff. So uh, tell me a little bit about your early entrepreneurship uh, startup stuff, because you had everything going for you and you talk about it early in your book. Tell us more about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing, the thing is, is that like, you know, I'm pretty, um, so, so the way that the book is written is, is out of order. Okay. Right. Like, like the thing is, is like, I had this startup at, um, in, in graduate school. And the thing that happened was, um, you know, we were, we, I was like a month from graduation and we were talking with, um, a large national company who I can't say who it was, but they rhymed with Walmart. And they wanted to implement our infrastructure nationwide. Like we're in conversations and they were like acting like they wanted to do this. Like we had a really interesting point of purchase uh, uh, device and advertising device. And the thing is, is that um, we were licensing the core technology, right? So I wasn't even looking for a job. Like I was like, this is going to work. Like I'm all in. Like we were finalists in the business plan competition. Like, you know, investors were starting to like be like, all right, call me when you get that contract, right? And um, we completely lost our license to the underlying technology uh, two days before I graduated, right? And it was just the whole rug was pulled out from under us and the whole business went from very promising to completely insolvent, it, like with, within hours. It was just so simple how it happened. Um, I've had a, a few other experiences like that, okay? And, and the thing is, is that I was so committed to, and then- by the way, just quick interlude, it was after that point that I was like, okay, look, I know there's a way to buy an existing company, right? I know that like looking at these startups, I know that there's a way to sort of get on base, right? Like the kind of money ball of entrepreneurship. I can go to the bank and get the money and buy these earnings from a company that's been around sustainable with earnings, infrastructure, uh, people, like all the rest of customers, right? Cash flow. And, um, and so that's what I did. And I bought a company and I ran it for seven years when I eventually sold that. Okay. To, to an acquisition target. That's when I was like, okay, I'm going to do a startup, but this time I am going to stack the deck, right? I've been CEO of a, of a, of a successful company. I had a successful exit. I've got the MBA. Like I've did the things like I have all the stuff. Let's, let's go do it. And so, um, uh, this is where viewpoint came from. Okay, and so Viewpoint uh, was a technology that it that was developed originally by some developers here in St. Louis, and it was something that I like. I saw it, and users loved it, right? And me and I hooked myself up with with. Well, I I need to make a long story short. We we pulled a team together. Um, uh, we uh, we we recruited an executive from Microsoft to be our CEO. Okay. 
we got into one of the top 10 accelerator programs in the world. Um, Curtis ran the raise where we oversubscribed the capital raise. Okay. So like, like we had all the things, we had all the money, we had the, 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 you know, Microsoft credential. We had this technology that the like users absolutely relished it. It was a SharePoint application, which is Microsoft. So it's relevant. Right. Um, and 18 months later, it just went belly up again, like just like burned all the cash without product market fit. So Deborah, the thing is, is, you know, I joke that I guess I'm just a, t a bad entrepreneur, but the truth is, is it's just statistics, right? So we all sort of know this axiom that like one out of 10 entrepreneurs kind of makes it, okay? Right? Here's yeah. the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. When you, first of all, when you talk to entrepreneurs, right, real ones that made it, they're like, oh, it's way lower than that. It's not one out of 10 because we know, we know, you know what I mean? Like, but, the, but, the, but here's the thing is that like, when you actually start looking at the numbers, right, when you actually like. I was reading Vern Harnish, his book, Scale Up, and I realized that only 4% of uh, companies in the United States ever exceed a million dollars in annual revenue. So yeah, Deborah, here's the thing. Yeah, so here's the thing. Like when I was in business school, like you wouldn't even look at a company with a million dollars in revenue. It's so tiny, right? Yes. And so I started realizing, oh my God, like if I started acquiring these businesses that were like one to $3 million in revenue, I'm literally acquiring one of the biggest companies in the in the country, if not the world, right? Right. Like, just, like it's a really low number for being so exceptional. And once that kind of lined up for me, I actually lowered the bar in terms of what I needed to accomplish, right? Because it's like you don't need to be 10 million, you don't need to be 20 million, right? Like if you go out and buy a company that's doing a million and a half dollars in revenue, you're you're already at the table, you're already in the game. And then you, uh, so you, you had that realization and that's where acquisition and entrepreneurship kind of lit you up and became your thing. So tell me a little bit. So we, we know, we know the problems with startups becoming, yep. starting your own business. And mm -hmm. we know that business is the most common pathway to wealth building. Oh yes. So now 100%. we know that acquisition and entrepreneurship or buying a business that already has revenue and so forth is yep. the best way to get a business going rather than build it yourself or, or buy it or start it yourself. So now we know that that's uh, the thing. Tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about the acquisition uh, process so that yeah. my listeners can sort of see, okay, what's that all about? How does that work? Yep. Yep. Okay. So, so I, I agree with you. I, I think that, you know, you, you know, you talk to like Garrett Gunderson, you know, like founder of wealth factory and all this stuff. And you're like, is business is, is business ownership like required? And he's like, it's a total game changer. Like it's the little thing that makes the big difference, right? Um, growing up, my grandfather used to almost shake his finger at me and say like, business ownership is the only way to make any real money. And it was like, okay, like I was getting this ingrained in my head right early. And <laughs> it, it's not only true, but the thing is, is that like buying an existing business, okay? Like, look, I'm not so naive to think that every single startup Okay, or every single business idea should be acquired instead of a startup. Some of them should be started. Okay, let's just that's true. But the thing is, is that like when I wrote by then build every no one understood the acquisition part, right? Like, so everyone was all about innovation. And the truth is, there's two ways to grow a company organic and acquisition. And you can look at the most innovative companies in the history of the world. And guess what? Let's use Microsoft. Okay, they bought over 100 companies in the last five years. It's just part of, you know, Elon Musk did not start Tesla. He bought it just like he bought Twitter, just like he bought PayPal, by the way, right? He was not a co-founder. He got sued by claiming he was a co-founder of Tesla early on, okay? He bought it. So the point is, is that like acquisition and, and innovation work together. And, and the thing is, is no one was talking about acquisition to start. And so Deborah, I think the truth is, is that like for most business ideas, OK, even just from I don't own a business to now I'm CEO for most ideas, acquisition makes the most sense for increasing of chances of sustainability of that business. Acquisition makes the most sense for most people. The fastest way between where they are today and building wealth tomorrow is to acquire a business, period. That's it. What, what do you think they need to do, if anything, in between? So like totally um, what what do you need to do? 
who do you need to be? What experience do you need to have before you acquire a business in order to be successful? Okay. So I think it depends, right? So here, here's the thing. Like, like you asked about the steps. Okay. When I started writing by then build, my concept was not, I did not want to be the guy, right? It, it was like, I like, yes, I've been doing this. I've been doing it for, I think I did it for about eight years before I started writing. Okay. I bought, um, you know, between four and seven companies by the time I started writing the book. Right. Cause, but I got the idea back in 2004 when I was trying to, trying to figure out how to do it and it didn't exist. Right. So what I wanted to do was, was go out and almost like Jim Collins style, right? Like I wanted to go out and like figure out like what the empirical evidence suggested. And like, you know, I wanted to interview a whole bunch of people and just find the best practices and all the rest of it. And what I was met with was, you know, people would say like, well, you know, I'd be like, well, what were you looking for? Right. And they'd be like, well, Walker, I was just looking for the same thing everyone else is looking for. I was looking for and then they would say something completely different, right? And I found that like this was a completely opaque market, okay? It was completely fragmented and there were no best practices. It's like every last thing was anecdotal. Every last event looked like a scatter chart. It was just all over. So it was like, okay, wait a minute. I'm not, I don't need to write the book on, on best practices. What I need to write the book on is frameworks for this space. Right. And this is how I came up with the AE matrix and also the prep funnel. Right. Which is maybe where you're going with this. The prep funnel was simply a matter of spending seven to 10 years out talking to brokers and people trying to help me find a business. And I always felt like their line of questioning was incorrect. It was faulty. Right. And then they would try to send, they would send me things that they thought I'd be interested in, but it was looking at the wrong things. Right. And so part of it, is that people who initially start to look for a business only about uh, only about ten percent of them actually buy something? Okay, um, I'm proud to say at the acquisition lab it's a lot higher than that, but you know whatever. But the point is is that um, only about ten percent succeed, and I think that it's because they don't understand the business model, they don't understand what it is that they're looking for. Okay, and they're not. Here's the big thing: you need to start by understanding what it is you bring to the table. Yes. Okay. So if you understand what you bring to the table, that's what you need to know. So for example, uh, and then I'll shut up, I promise. The point is, if you want to acquire like a, um, an e-com business and just buy the four hour work week, okay, and sort of like learn e-commerce as you're buying it, like I, I can support that concept. You don't need to be an e-com expert just to buy a, an e-com company, right? But maybe don't buy a $10 million e-com company. Maybe, maybe buy one that's a million dollars or two or three or 500,000 if that's where you are, right? But like, but like if you are you know, a manufacturing operations specialist and you've been doing that for 20 years and you're sick and tired of being you know, second in command and you just need your own gig, then you know what you bring to the table and you know what you need to find, right? Some business that maybe doesn't have tight operations, some business that does have sales, you know, direct sales in place, right? So something that, you know, maybe the owner of the business that's stepping out is the person running operations and, you know, you, and they're, and hopefully they're doing a terrible job because now you can walk in and see those easy value add opportunities because it's what you do. Right. And so, and so you almost look for the shell that, that complements you because the first day that you own that company, that company has never existed before because now you are the owner and CEO of the business. Let me ask you this because I yeah. completely agree with you. Uh, yeah. But most people don't know what they bring to the table. How do they figure that out? I mean, if you've been in the manufacturing business for 20 years, you know. Yeah. But yeah. let's say you're not there. Let's say you've been in, maybe you're coming right out of a, a school. Or, and is that even smart to do that, to acquire a business then? Yeah. Or maybe you um, have been an employee all your life for maybe say yeah. years, or 10 years you've been an employee. Yeah. Okay. So, so how, do, how do you, how do you figure out with those people, what they bring to the table? Okay. Well, I, I think I don't have, I don't have like a silver bullet for this answer, right? Cause it's kind of, it's yeah. kind of a moving target. But what I would say is, is like, you know, if you've been, okay, number one, Number one, it's what are you interested in, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you have interest in, in, in marketing, but like you're not quite the expert yet, you know where you want to go, okay? And I, I use this analogy a lot. 
Deborah, and that's and and I think that's really appropriate here is that uh, I was a um, uh, Missouri state champion in cycling, like road bikes. Okay, like in my thirties, right? Like you know, I just crush all these like people, you know, all these guys in their twenties, which was kind of cool. But anyway. The point is, is I was really into cycling and I logged a lot of hours. And so for anyone who has any kind of hobby like that, we all know, what do you do when you're not cycling? You hang out at the bike shop and like, look at the gear and like, talk to the people and like, you just, you know, you're around it. Right. And so, um, uh, the thing that I noticed was that, um, there's a difference in how men and women shop for a bicycle. Okay. And women, when they would come in, you know, people would say like, all right, well, what kind of riding are you doing? What kind of, what kind of bike are you looking for? And they would always buy at, at the same level at the level of their activity. Like they'd be like, okay, I'm, I'm interested in maybe doing some, some longer rides, but really right now I just ride around forest park. So like maybe something like this. And it was, you know, it was kind of, kind of a little bit of a budget and like trying to like really figure out like, where am I and what, what is the bike that matches where I am? Okay. Guys would come in and <laughs> Deborah, I mean, nine out of 10 of them would walk in and be like, the only difference between me and Lance Armstrong is that I don't have a carbon fiber bike. Okay. <laughs> and they come in and they would have to get the, the matte black bike with the shiny black thing and like the carbon wheels and like, you know, and they're, and they're dropping 10 or $12,000 because it's got Dura Ace components or whatever, you know? And it was just sort of like the difference between where I am now and where I want to be. Okay. And so the thing is, is I feel like I've never been able to buy a company where I am. There's always a leap of faith. Okay. There's always the unknown. There's always the like, this is where I want to go. Okay. And so I think that you need to get confident. And I think that the way you get confident is really by understanding the business model and also understanding what you're interested in and what you, I guess, you know, we use personality assessments, right? Because we right. all have strengths right. and weaknesses. Right. And I believe that people are either... I, people are either a revenue generator or a profit maximizer, just at the macro level, right? And like, you've got to know which one of those you are, right? And where you are in the spectrum. I think the testing really helps. That's one of the things I enjoyed the most about the acquisition lab was oh, thank you. Uh, going actually going through the testing. I thought it was really, really helpful. And even if you have an intuition about what you think you are, it sort of reinforces. And sometimes I think it's particularly good for women because mm -hmm. not only do women shop at the level mm -hmm. that they are for their bike, mm -hmm. but women um, uh, try to, they think they have to have 99% in place before they can take on that next role. And men think they, if they have 60%, they'll jump for it. That's so right. women need, they, they need, um, they need the push of knowing who they are and what they really can go for. Will you extrapolate on that? Because that's a really important. That's a really important concept. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if it's a cultural thing or what it is exactly. Um, but in the corporate in the corporate space, very commonly that's true that women will not step up, and some of it may be they're afraid of getting criticized, and and culturally we've been uh, conditioned to be example? nice. Yeah. Can you give me an example? How, like, how we're, of, yeah. Of how we've been conditioned to be nice. Or, or more uh, like you know, if there's a job listing, right? Yeah. If there's yeah. a job listing, mm -hmm. a man's looking at it versus a woman is looking at it, whether they go for it or not. Yeah. Uh, so it, a man might say, oh, uh, being promoted to manager here of this group. Huh, yeah, I can do that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> And a woman will go, I don't know, I've only managed two people before, and this is going to be seven. And, you know, maybe I should go for something that's managing four people before I try to go to seven. Yes. Uh, it's Some of it's confidence. Some of it is a fear of being criticized. Um, you know, women, unfortunately, are really taught to be nice. So they, they put up with a lot of things sometimes, even uh, this is completely off topic, but like sexual advances and stuff, they, they were trying to be nice and they're they maybe should be saying no when they, and not yes. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. all I, I can just tell you that's a personal anecdotal observation that women will not jump in as fast. I think there's some data that shows that too. But I, um, I, on the other hand, there's women who don't want to climb the corporate ladder. There's too many obstacles that are culturally in place with a culture of overwork. Mm -hmm. And 
one of the things I love about about acquisition entrepreneurship for women, first of all, I think they're really good at business. They got they got they're wired well for it. And the other thing is, it's like you don't have to climb the corporate ladder. It's escalator up. It is. It is. Yeah. It, it is. yeah. It's, right. it's, so it's the most amazing thing. And I think um, just having some support, I mean, I think the acquisition lab is an amazing thing. We're going to send women that way, but um, just having the support and encouragement and role models will make the difference. And it's so important, I think, because it puts women into a position of influence. Mm-hmm. Uh, it brings, uh, it brings in revenue. It's a great way to grow wealth. Mm-hmm. Um, and as you know, my personal goal is get more money, power, and influence in the hands of women because women create more balance and peace in the world. And I, I also think women, you know, we have a lot of things on our plate, maybe a lot of things we're doing with family and stuff that maybe men don't feel as obligated toward, but women need to step up because they are uniquely wired for the problems we currently have in the world. And I think yep. that if women don't get money, if they don't get power and influence, in greater amounts that we will not be able to solve those problems with the balance that we need. And that's one of my driving forces for bringing women into acquisition entrepreneurship. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. You know, you, you, you talk about myths around entrepreneurship uh, a little bit. Okay. Isn't that right? No, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because I think there's a lot of women who are, under the influence of those myths. Okay. Um, I, I don't have them off of the tip of my tongue, but I can, I can roll here. I've got five. So let's see, let's see how I can do. I haven't done this talk in a while. Um, and in no particular order. Okay. So, so one is, I, is, is I would say that a lot of people um, think that you need a lot of money. Okay. In order to buy a business. Okay. And the truth is that it's just not true. Okay. Now, I guess on the one hand it is, and on the one hand it's not, right? Like one of the questions that we ask in the interview of the acquisition lab is, do you have access to $100,000, okay? We don't ask if you have it, okay? But the the truth is, is that if you say no to that question, you don't have it, you can't access it, that's a little more fundamental than like actually us being able to get you to the place where you're buying a business and running it, right? So it, it would be doing a disservice. You've got some fundamental stuff that you need to that you need to figure out. But the point is, is that you know you can buy one of the largest companies in the world for about the same down payment as as the average price of a home in America, right? So the thing is, is the lenders will lend on it. The banks are there and they want to support you in that. Okay, they want the loan. Um, that's that's one component. Um, two is simply the economy, right? So, so the first one, you don't have to have a lot of money to be buying a business. Number two is the, is, is a lot of people think that the economy is driven by small business, by, by startups. Okay. Mm -hmm. Startups in particular, but the truth is that's not right at all. Um, I think it's, I think it's, um, so if you look at, um, they're called gazelles is the word for it, for it. And it's basically a business that started at a million dollars in revenue or more that then went on to grow at 20% or more per year for four or five years. Okay. And these are the, these are the, are the businesses that is the total economic engine. I I don't have the stats off the top of my head, but it's an alarming amount. It's like 70% of the economy Mm -hmm. is driven by these companies. And the, and these gazelles can be, can be elephants or mice, right? But it's the point is it's the, it's the growth of these companies and has nothing to do with whether it's a startup or not. In fact, most gazelles are um, 25 years old, okay? They were founded 25, two, de- two and a half decades ago. They're not new companies, right? Mm-hmm. That, those are the ones that make the biggest impact. Um, next is going to be, um, you have to be passionate, right, about an idea. And what I would tell you is <clears throat> you don't. Uh, and, and I think that you can, this can be a very unpopular concept, but the thing is, is that like business, like I have a good friend of mine who he started so many companies and I just look up, he's a mentor in a lot of ways. And, um, he said to me once, he goes, Walker, he, he, we were, I think we we're having beers or something, you know, like at an EO event maybe. And he, and he said something like, um, Walker, do you, have you ever like started a business? You were like so passionate about it. And there was just like sparkles in your eyes and you couldn't wait to get going. And like, you know, you put some team on it, you put some money in it, you know, you know, and you're trying and you're trying and you're like really make it. 
and like it's just not going but you keep doing it and you keep doing it and then it just like kind of wears you out until you're like oh god i hate this right and then you just don't do it anymore and then sometimes you see an opportunity that you're like oh well look that would kind of work right there like those things go together like maybe let's try just try that and then you try it and then all of a sudden it starts making money and you're like oh man i'm so passionate about that now <laughs> and so it's so funny you'd say that because we had that exact conversation as we're in the process of acquiring a business. Um, my business partner and I had that exact conversation because we said, you know, uh, do we, are we, you know, passionate enough about this business? And my partner said, you know, I think sometimes actually that's worse because then sometimes you get dazzled yes. by the sparkle and right. you don't actually, you know, take the steps that you need to, 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 you don't stay dispassionate about it. So you don't say, okay, we can grow this. We think there's opportunity here. Uh, this person wasn't really very good at sales, was great at producing content, but we're great at sales and we're great at tightening yeah. up the operations and we can double this next year. And we think That's we can right. double it again next year, even though we're not experts in or highly passionate about what it is. And I said, that is so smart. You know, it's exactly what you're well, saying. I'm so glad you think that because it's, it's one of these where... Um you know, people, you know, we've always heard like, whatever the wise people on the top of the mountain say it's, it's not, it's not getting to the peak, but it's the journey, right. That, that it's all, that is, that it's all about. And, and I think that it's really the same. Like you have to, you have to just fall in love with the systems and the processes and the opportunity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, yesterday at the lab, I'll even say that, um, and this comes back to, you know, what do you bring to the table? Like you often will fall in love with the growth opportunity. Right. And so we had it. We have a gentleman who's looking for a member who's looking for a. Um, um, he's, he's got a tech background. OK, like, you know, um, uh, what's it? What's the big the big accelerator? It's not tech stars. It's it's um, the other one in Silicon Valley. Um, y Combinator. He, so we had a startup at Y Combinator. He had a massive exit like it like just and, and like he knows how to scale technology. And I don't think I'm giving anything away by saying, am I breaking a non, no, it's, I think it's okay. He ended up, I'm going to oversimplify for, for it to exaggerate. Okay. It's a copy machine business. Okay. And it's one of these where he can't believe that he's looking at it because it's copy machines, but he's looking at the systems that are underlying it and the growth opportunity. And he's just going, oh my gosh, like I, I want to do this activity because I can see what, what needs to happen. Right. And so that's, that's, um, that's the concept. You fall in love with, with, with what it is. Passionate about original idea. Okay. Um, we talked about innovation, right. And, and how like acquisition. Um, so a lot of, a lot of, entre a lot of would be entrepreneurs are like, it's gotta be innovative. Right. But the truth is, is that like, when you look at most, the businesses, most entrepreneurs are starting. If you read Peter Thiel, he calls them zero to one where you're like changing the world. Like something didn't exist and now it exists. Okay. That's a startup. Right. But most people, are just going N plus one, right? Like you're a doctor, okay? My first dentist started a dental practice, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, it didn't work out, so he joined a practice. <laughs> and then and then about 20 years later, he broke out and did his own practice, but he took half the business or whatever. <laughs> I'm not suggesting you do that, but that's what happened. <laughs> and then here's what happened. I'm, I go in one day and he retired. And there's a new dentist and that dentist bought the practice, right? And so that, so the thing is, is like, if you're a dentist, just in this analogy, you don't have to start a new dental practice. There's plenty of them out there, right? If you're an SEO expert, you don't have to hang a new shingle. Like you can just go do a roll up and buy the 10 or 12 that are, that are in your neighborhood already, right? So most people are not creating these like massively innovative uh, startups. They're really just doing like kind of N plus one sort of situations. And that's, and there's really lots more of that. So you don't really have to innovate from zero. You can, well, yeah. you can find a company where you see opportunity to grow the revenue. And that's the, that's, that's what you can get passionate about rather than whatever it yeah. is. I mean, you can get passionate yeah. about the rings around the, <laughs> yeah. Around the, the yeah. I mean, it's just a myth. It's a myth that like you have to be innovative. And even if you yeah. go read Jim Collins, right? Like how he wrote a book called how the mighty fall. And it's all about like how like sure these these new companies actually introduce ideas to into markets, but it's actually the incumbents that make the leap 
that actually end up dominating the space anyway. It's not the innovative companies that introduce it. Yeah, all good, yeah. All, all good information. And it's uh, sort of giving, I think that, that myth busting gives women permission to not yeah. have those criteria. There's one more myth that I have. Okay. Yes. So I actually, while you were talking, I opened my, my, my old uh, PowerPoint. So I've got the five myths are you have to be passionate about an original idea. Okay. You have to be innovative. Startups drive the economy. Okay. And then um, venture capital. So like, you know, people are like, oh, I, you know, I don't want to, you know, the, like the, the epitome is that I'm going to start this business. I'm going to bring in venture capital and I'm going to run out. Like that's the A game. That's the pro level. And it's true. However, um, 75%, 75% of all firms that raise capital from venture capital goes completely to zero. So I want entrepreneurs to understand that the people that make money in the venture capital game are the venture capitalists. They're the casino, right? And every once in a while, you'll see someone over there winning big. Right. Because every once in a while, an entrepreneur makes it and that entrepreneur ends up on the cover of the magazines and all the rest of it. And it's the point zero zero one percent. Right. But the, the thing is, is that the the um, uh, the economy is being driven by smaller businesses. Yeah. Not, and not being by small businesses, not those. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. right. Super. Tell us a little bit about the acquisition lab. I know I'm going to have interest. So tell us a little bit about the Acquisition Lab, uh, what that's all about and what happens there. Yeah, well, thanks for asking. I, I think, you know, it's one of these where first and foremost, I, I never want to look like I'm selling anything. So, so like, I, I, you know, first, you know, if you go to buythenbuild.com, there's a ton of free resources. Um, you know, it took me four and a half years to write Buy Then Build. It's, you know, a $4 ebook or something, you know, like start with the cheap stuff. <laughs> But, that, but, you know, what I would say is, is that like the acquisition lab was something where, you know, I get about 20 people a week that, you know, are like, Hey, like, you know, I, like, will you talk to me? I want to pick your brain, right. About, uh, you know, I read your book. It sounds great. I want to talk to you about like this business, or I want to talk to you about what I'm doing wrong, or I want to, you know, like, will you consult with me or whatever? And I'm like, how do I, how do I grow? How do I scale this? Like at a point where I can actually talk to all these people and I want to make it very affordable right because the thing is is like i could i could take any one of these people and just do what you know buy side advisors do and charge them one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars and like spend their money but that's not what we're talking about we're talking about people who need to find their way right so i got the idea for the acquisition lab probably around somewhere around 2010 okay and it was actually highly inspired by a company called veritas prep and veritas prep was sort of like the elite provider to test prep Okay. And it was sort of like, we want to have like this amazing experience for people that are trying to go to business school and change their lives. Right. So that, that was a big influence. And the, the concept behind the acquisition lab is, okay, look, number one, let's start with a vetted community. Okay. Like if you like, this is not a, Hey, I read the wall street journal bestselling book and now I'm going to join the mastermind and, you know, pay a whole bunch of money to join a group of people that aren't actually going to execute. That's not what we're doing. Okay. 75% of applicants actually don't get in. Okay. And, um, I don't want that to scare anybody though, either. Like, like, you know, it's, it's, it's not like people that like yourself that are, you know, doctors, right. You know, or, or like people with ex all these degrees and all this wealth and all this stuff, it's, there's some in there. In our latest cohort, we had a guy that took a company public on the NASDAQ and then did it a second time. Like just, you know, amazing. We have other people that haven't really done anything before and, you know, they succeed and, you know, by, you know, whatever, a pool management company or what, whatever, whatever works for them. Right. And so it, it has nothing to do with, with, you know, like looking impressive or like applying to an Ivy league school. That's not what it is. Um, but, um, the thing is, is that everyone who's in the group, we believe is going to succeed or at least has the ability to succeed. Okay. And as a result, um, I don't know of another program that has a, um, a success rate at the same level that we do. And we have grown success rate uh, by by no training by 200%. We just closed over 100 million in transactions. Our, mem our members have. We, we don't make any money off that. So this it was like, okay, well, how am I going to do this, though? And I decided to anchor in world-class education. And it was like, okay, well, what does world-class education look like? And so I started learning about education. And 
like higher order thinking and like how do people like apply lessons? And then I hired a curriculum designer to work with me, right? To come up with, okay, how, like she, she does accredited programs and certification programs and we built out this curriculum. And then it was like, okay, I need tools and resources. And, you know, we pay for subscriptions for things for people to understand industries and do research. And then the big thing was group coaching. I did not want this to be the Walker Dival show. Okay. Any one person that's up there talking about, here's how you just listen to me. Here's how you master this like completely inefficient market. Trust me, they're wrong. Right. So what we do is today we have 10 coaches, 10 advisors that have all acquired multiple businesses. Okay. I guess, except Brian, who basically ran due diligence for, for a number of companies over about six years. Um, and the thing is, is that like, they've all done it and they all have a different take. Right. So we've got people who have bought manufacturing companies. We have people that have bought like over two dozen online businesses. We have people that were, you know, the TA of the entrepreneurship through acquisition program at Booth University, started a formal search fund, acquired a business and is now doing a roll up, leading a roll up in a whole different space, you know, so on and so forth. And so the thing is, is that like every week there's like six different calls. Right. And then every other week I run something called the search forum where it's not a normal coaching call where it's like, hey, let's talk to you for six minutes and then move on, right? It's like, let's get into your deal. And so we'll sit on a deal for 40 to 60 minutes um, and, the, and the group gets to learn because it's all about doing reps, right, Debra? Like if you were to bring this deal you're working on to the search forum, there's another 20 people in the room. Everyone signed confidentiality agreements. You're not gonna mention the name of the company, right? But we're able to work through like, okay, what are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? How are you thinking about this? And it allows people to get out of their living room by themselves while they're trying to make one of the most important decisions of their life. Yeah. And, and what I couldn't have predicted is how awesome the community is, right? Like I knew we were vetting people, but like just the, like now I'm at the point, Deborah, that I can't believe I'm actually a member of this group. <laughs> it's just so strong right you know and then we've got this slack channel and we, we i think we have two advisors now that do nothing but you know but work in this that advise in the slack channel right so that, that was the concept it was like how do we create you know not just sort of like a mastermind where there's 99 percent of people blind leading the blind in some useless facebook group but how do you how do you sort of elevate this group and actually get results for everybody and that's what we've tried to build with the acquisition lab Thanks for asking. Uh, I, uh, I heard Chelsea Wood, who, you know, runs your acquisition lab. I heard her story about when she quit her job and talked to her husband about working with the acquisition lab. And her husband said, so there's this guy that believes in acquisition entrepreneurship and that startups fail. And he wants you to come and work for his startup. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay. Can I tell you something? Like it, the irony is not lost on me, right? But but the thing is, is like I can say everything I just said, and it's like, wow, what a great idea. But what I did with the lab was something that I've never done before, even with viewpoint. Okay, the first thing I did was hire the most expensive person I've ever hired at at, at the early stage, and say like, you're in charge. Okay, like you're gonna run this. And she she took a company from three billion to six billion just doing buy side biz dev. And then has a graduate degree in IO psychology and then spent five years doing post-merger integration. And I met her um, getting the, uh, the certified M&A during the certified M&A advisor program years ago. So I knew she was perfect and I didn't know that I was going to be able to recruit her. And she is really the secret sauce that has that has made the lab what it is you know i mean yeah. i wrote a book but chelsea is the one that that really really has yeah. made the lab everything we're, we're going to get yeah. chelsea on the on the podcast too to, to talk more about acquisition entrepreneurship from her point of view and uh well it's been fun. it's been fun talking to you i could talk to you for hours walker we got to get together but um mm -hmm. thanks so much well, thanks so much yeah. for sharing i really want to encourage people to go uh to our show notes and find your links, um, quite like brokerage, if you're looking for um, an online business. I've been very, very impressed with Quiet Light. And uh, thank you so much for sharing. Thanks for coming on. And we're going to get back to you when we get more women involved in acquisition entrepreneurship. They need to. I, I, believe, I believe that. So thank you for having me. Total pleasure. Take care. You too, Deborah. Thank you. Pleasure is mine. 
This is Dr. Deborah Ekstrom for Money Loves Women podcast. To your health, to your wealth, and to your happiness. May blessings rain down upon you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Money Loves Women podcast. Please leave us a rating and review so we know how we can improve. Visit moneyloveswomen.com to gain more insight into how to live an extraordinary life.